So I just want to welcome y'all today to um, Celebrating Women Who Pivot. This is hosted by Forge. Um, and I'm sure that many of y'all on this call participated in our um, uh, celebrating of International Women's Day, which was, we um, did it March 6th, I think International Women's Day was actually March 8th, and it was such a great event, and it's so crazy to think back that um, that there was 150 of us together in one room, and it was such an amazing event, and as we were thinking a couple months ago about how we could encourage women in business in Birmingham, what we could do, we thought, how cool would it be to have bring back the sponsors of that event who were so amazing um, and have them on the panel and share some of the great things they have done during COVID. And we are so lucky to have one of the panelists from that event be the moderator today with Ashley. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope that this time is encouraging for you and um, we'll really um, just really encourage you wherever you are right now. I, we all know that the emotions are high, low, you feel like you're losing your mind and then you feel like you can tackle it. So hopefully from the stories today from these women, um, you will feel encouraged. So I wanna do a quick commercial break for Forge and I actually learned this from uh, Ms. Jackie Jones, who is going to um, host our next webinar on Thursday, September 10th. We would love for y'all to join us, how to prepare for website design. Jackie um, runs One Degree Marketing, and she has hosted several webinars and used to do in-person events for us in marketing. She is a marketing guru, guru and great. So I hope y'all can join us. You never attend something with Jackie that you don't walk away with like three practical pieces of content that you can apply that day. So hope y'all join us for that. And then on September 18th, we are doing Celebrating Women Who Pivot Part Two. And we're bringing, if you were at the event, the International Women's Day, you will remember, um, we were fortunate enough to have some awesome, awesome swag bags from um, filled with things from amazing vendors female vendors in Birmingham. So we're bringing back three of them um, to do sort of the same format. But um, so we will have Jen Ryan from Blue Root, Tiffany Martin from Ignite, and Tanisha Sim Summer from um, Naughty But Nice Cuddle Corn. So hopefully y'all can join us for that. We will be sending up an email following this um, webinar and it'll have all the links that you need so that you can sign up. And lastly, just a quick, um, commercial for what we are for we are a co-working space if y'all were at the event um, you'll recognize kind of this space in the picture this is our new space that we just opened but um, we are a co-working space so if you are stuck at home and need an option besides just your kitchen table or um, in the basement we do because of the expansion that we just had we have a lot of space where you can be socially distanced and um, have a productive work day. So definitely follow up with us if that's something that would interest y'all. So um, without further ado, I am gonna turn over to Ashley and uh, let her get started today. I do want Ashley, Ashley is the moderator. So that means people are not gonna be asking her questions about what she's doing. But Ashley, as we get started, I would love it if you would just give a brief um, intro of, or who you, uh, brief who you are, what y'all are doing, and how Mixtros has um, adapted to um, our new circumstances. And yes. I'm gonna turn my camera off. I'll be back at the end for the Q&A. Okay, sounds like a plan. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's so nice to like see everyone. Like I see that there, are, you know, a lot of people on here, so that's great. But like, it's it's weird not to see y'all, but you get what I'm saying. Um, when Kim said that uh, the last time that we were all together, like if you were at that actual event and it's been so long, it does feel like it was decades ago. But I think the world has gone through this profound shift now because we have all adapted to the way things need to be done today to get to where we need to go. And I think that's a testament to these ladies that we're going to talk to this morning. So as far as myself, I am Ashley Ammons. I am one of the co-founders of a software company called Mixtros. If you were at 
the events, the live event that was in March, you actually had the opportunity to use Mixtros. And it is a software that's used to increase engagement and collect data. Basically, it takes the work out of network. That's what we say here internally. And so my entire business was built on live events. And in March, we stopped having live events. And so we very quickly uh, had to figure out what to do. The great thing for us is prior to COVID happening, we were actually looking to roll out a virtual feature in our software. We just thought it was going to come to the market in October of this year, but we were able to flip-flop some things around. And so we got the virtual product out to the market in about April. And since then, it has really been kind of starting from scratch. It's like you had customers who were keyed up to be using Mixtros Live like over the course of the year. And then some of those customers dropped, some of them switched to virtual. So it has really been about creating awareness about the, um, the gap that we fill. And so what we have found on the virtual side is there are a ton of softwares out there right now that do virtual things, connect people virtually. Um, we're on one of them now. Zoom is very obviously the market leader because people just say Zoom even though they might mean WebEx or Microsoft Teams or anything else, they just say Zoom. So Zoom has kind of become Band-Aid. It's a brand that has taken over the category. And what we have found is, our software can be a complement to things like Zoom because Zoom wasn't really made for peer-to-peer -peer engagement. Zoom was made for what we're doing right now, which is there is someone talking, disseminating information, or when you're talking one-to-one -one with someone on Zoom. Even though you can go into breakout room features on Zoom, there's really no rhyme or reason for why you get there and humans need their why. When humans are put in a small group, they need to know why so that the engagement can start and it can be as frictionless as possible. And so that's what our software mixtures does. So I'm like, we're still alive, guys. Uh, we're still going, but I am looking forward to the conversation this morning with these lovely ladies who I had the opportunity to connect with a week or so ago to kind of just go over what's been going on. So the first thing that I want to do um, during this conversation is I kind of want to just ask some, uh, let me call them rapid fire questions for um, Ashley, Mary, and Lauren uh, to just set the tone so you guys can get to know them better. So Ashley, I'm going to start with you and um, I'm going to ask you just a list of questions that you can just give us like bite-sized answers too, just so everyone can get to know you. So okay. um, at first, obviously, we'd love to know your short intro and what is it that you do? Although most of us know what you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, Ashley McMakin and I own Ashley Max, and um, we have five locations. I um, just opened our fifth um, during the pandemic, which was interesting, at the Bazette. Um, we have over 100 employees. Um, so it's just been a wild ride that I'm excited to share about. Um, we have three kids and a foster son that we just moved to Tuscaloosa. Um, so we have our hands full at home too. <laughs> Love it. Uh, where are you from originally? I'm from here. I'm from Birmingham. I went to oh, Briarwood. You... Yep. And then went to the University of Alabama. Yep. Okay. I was going to say, I was like, she's a native. I like it. And then I, I was actually going to ask that question. So you went to the University of Alabama. What did you study? And the reason that I asked this question is for people who are thinking about entrepreneurship, I think a fun fact is only 9% of entrepreneurs actually have a business degree. So I'm curious, what is, what did you study when you were in school and what oh, did you I'm think you were going to do? Well, I guess I'm lucky on the 9%. I actually yeah. studied business <laughs> and um, I was a, I had a marketing major. And so that was my focus. But interesting, I actually really wanted to do hotel and restaurant management. But then I wasn't positive that that's the direction I would go in with food, even though I knew at the time I was very interested in food. So I honestly did marketing just to do something more general is really the reason I did that. But then it ended up kind of working out that I can use that too, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned your family makeup. Thank you, which ladies, I think that that's an important thing um, to note because we know women do a lot. Like if you're working and you got a household, you're doing the most, right? So your family makeup, you mentioned, so you have one son that has gone to um, University of Alabama. Yes. And then right. what's going on as far as schooling and home right now at home right now for your other kids? Yes. Well, mine, thank goodness, finally just went back to school. They're all in elementary. So they are in every day. So we're just praying it stays that way. <laughs> so they just started back last week. And then I can share later about obviously with everyone else. We were doing virtual in the spring and nothing all summer long. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say to fill the time is interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, where were you when your business idea hit you? Like, Oh, what was the um, thing that made you say, uh, yeah? 
Originally, okay, yes. So I actually was working at Martin Advertising. We had just gotten married and I was working there and um, one of the girls that was in the cubicle next to me, we kind of got to be friends and knew we both loved to cook and honestly just started it on a whim as a hobby. Thought this was something I would do till we had kids. Went through infertility for years and during those years, I was like, well, I guess, you know, if we're not having kids right now, I'm gonna keep this thing going. My husband left his job, started helping me. And then also, honestly, it was totally, it wasn't a big planned thing, even though I loved food and knew I was interested in it. It wasn't something that was, you know, planned for years. It was kind of like, oh, I'll try this. And then word of mouth, being a Birmingham native, knowing a lot of people here, family, friends, you know, would let me cater for them. And then kind of word trickled out and things grew. And we were just out of our Homewood condo at the time. And then found a place in Bluff Park in 2007. And so that was our first like legit, you know, that was when it was named Ashley Max and all that. And then kind of went from there. So, so yeah, mine was definitely just a a little hobby that turned into something much bigger than I thought it would be. (laughs) Well, and see, that's an amazing thing because I think that that's a quintessential entrepreneur story in the sense that you were dabbling, but then the dabble turned into, oh my gosh, this is real. So like you were doing market testing without even knowing that you were doing market testing, which is a great way to roll into having a business. So that's awesome. I was also Um, very young and didn't know what I was getting into. So that was probably good. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and I was going to say, so you, so how long then, like, so 2007, you had your first brick and mortar. I was 20 something, um, 27, I think. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. I mean, which, I mean, to own a restaurant, I mean, that's pretty awesome. So how, so what year did you actually start dabbling? 2005. So so two years yep. of market testing, yep. essentially, yep. before you made the decision to go brick and mortar. And exactly. so now you've had brick and mortars for, what are we talking, 13 years? 13 years, yep. That's yep. pretty awesome. But, you know, I number like one I- brick and mortar did, doesn't look like number five brick and mortar. You know, number one was like no restaurant, just a catering kitchen. So yes. it was definitely, even though it might seem fast, it was definitely slow smart growth not like oh I'm gonna put all my eggs in one basket and go build the biggest best store and hope people come you know what I mean it was definitely like we kind of let the demand pull us versus the other way around you know absolutely which let me just say like so Ashley's in food I'm in software but what she's saying like it's it's uh there's uh this misconception I think um in the media that when you're an entrepreneur it's just supposed to go shoom (laughs) and what you've done is built a strong foundation because that first restaurant and those first several restaurants helped you figure out like all right well that doesn't work we ain't gonna do that again and now on your fifth you're like well we were well machine like I know (laughs) I know exactly where the potholes are. You know, I know exactly like how my tables need to be laid out because it doesn't cause this issue or that issue. I mean, easy things like that. Until until COVID hit. (laughs) Well, I was going to say until COVID hit. And the last question that I have for you right now is tell us the, your favorite dish that you have available right now uh, that uh, it could be something that came out of the pandemic, something new, but what is your favorite thing on the menu right now? Oh, okay. Um, I will say, um, we have a barbecue chicken pizza that we are obviously not a pizza place, but I used to make it at home all the time. My husband was always like, we've got to sell this. And I'm like, oh, we're not a pizza place. And I'm not trying to, I'm very particular with what goes on our menu. I want it to be like the best of the best. I don't want to, you know, be like a cheesecake factory. Sorry, but you know, like a, a, you know, huge menu and like, I want to have, you know, very good ingredients. So anyway, I was just very specific about how I wanted it to be done. And so during COVID, it was one of those things like what else people were coming in and grabbing, you know, all of our meals to go. And I'm like, what else could we provide for them? That would be something, you know, that they could come in here and get take home. And so I was like, I'm going to try my pizza. Like, why not at this point? What do we have to lose? You know? So it's been a big seller and it's just something, you know, we're not trying to compete with all the, you know, awesome pizza places here. It's just one little pizza that we like the way we do it. And so anyway, so that's probably the favorite on my menu right now. (laughs) Okay, y'all, it's Friday, so you heard what she said. <laughs> heard what, yeah, I was, you heard what she said. All right, thank you, Ashley. I'm going to come back around to you, okay. and now I'm going to move over to Mary. Good morning, Mary. How are you? You're on, oh, there great. we go. Hi, guys. I love it. So, Mary, um, we're going to go through a similar round of questions, but tell us who you are, what you do. I am Mary Drennan, and I am one of the co-founders of Nourish Foods. Nourish creates um, 
high quality, healthy, fully prepared meals and delivers them to our clients' doorsteps nationwide. All right, got you. Um, tell me if you could describe your like, I'm gonna say entrepreneur persona in one word, what is it? Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> my business partner sitting across from me. She and I have been in business together for 15 years, so she would probably have a better answer for this. Um, I am an Enneagram eight wing seven. So I am like a classic entrepreneur challenger. She's punching the air. Um, uh -huh. I am big picture thinker. Um, and Tiffany luckily is my side. We are like very balanced in that she is super detail oriented and focused on like the minutia details that I do not want to focus on. And she doesn't want to focus on other things that I like to focus on. So that's me. Well, okay, so everybody, I have to pause there because we're about to nerd out for a second. So for anybody that is either in a business with a co-founder or anyone who is thinking about starting a business with a co-founder, I highly recommend, and I bet Mary would co-sign on this, that you understand what your Enneagram and or Myers-Briggs uh, personality types are. And what's so interesting about what Mary just said is my mom and I are business partners, and so um, on the Myers, so what you described is my mom is you, Mary, and I'm your co-founder. So we yeah. are the exact same in the sense that my mom is a big picture thinker and I am um, super detail oriented. And those things tend to complement one another because our minds work similarly, but we're not into the same thing. So we can pick up where the other leaves off. And when you can get that achieved, it's such a beautiful thing. And so um, for Myers-Briggs, what Mary is essentially identifying is she's actually perfectly suited to be an entrepreneur because she has executive personality type, um, <laughs> which means she's a big thinker. She's always looking forward. She's, uh, you know, one of her primary things is making sure money's running through here the right way and all that kind of thing. So that is fascinating. I highly recommend y'all nerd out. One place where you can easily go nerd out is there's this awesome little quiz. It takes 12 minutes. It's free. It's on a website called 16personalities.com. And when you take that quiz, you'll be able to read about yourself and it honestly will start to feel like you're reading in um an autobiography. It was funny because when I took that quiz the first time, my personality type is counsel. And it, the first thing it said was, you were likely a football player or a cheerleader. And I was like, ding, ding, ding. So yeah, so that's a very, very interesting. Okay, so Mary, let's get back at it. All yeah. right, so where are you from? I am from Birmingham. I grew up I'm here. Like, I left. Like, I know. I actually didn't know Ashley, but we're the same age. Um, I went to Washington and Lee University in Virginia and have um, an English degree from there. At the time, they did not have an entrepreneurship plot or minor. They do now, but I wouldn't have taken it anyway because I wanted to find the easiest way to graduate. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, um, and then I have a culinary degree from French Culinary Institute in New York. So, very cool. Yeah, food was always my background. Business was not. What did you what what was the goal? What did you think when you were studying? What were you what were you thinking was the thing that you were gonna do? Um, I really actually had always wanted to come back and work for the test kitchens at Southern Progress. And so after a couple of years in New York, um, I did that and I came back here to work at Cooking Light magazine for five years um, before I left after I had my first child. Got it. Okay. Well, then I was going to say you brought me into the perfect segue. So let's talk about your family. What is the makeup of your family? Woo, we have a big challenging makeup. So I have, um, I'm on my second marriage. And so I have a daughter that is in the sixth grade from my first marriage. My husband has three older kids, one of which is in college. One is a senior in high school and one is in the eighth grade. And then my husband and I had twins together that are in 4K. All right, y'all, yeah. y'all, everybody heard that, right? Okay, I'm like this, I, well, y'all, let me, full disclosure over here, I'm single, I just got a dog. So like, I, I, I'm, the way that I'm considered right now, I'm doing the most, but then I talked to these ladies and I was like, oh, you're okay, you all right. Um, okay. <laughs> Um, tell me, what is the best thing that happened for you this week, business or personally? 
Wow, we had a lot of good things happen this week, I gotta say. Yeah. I mean, I was gonna say, pour them on. You know what? Entrepreneurship is a roller coaster ride. So the highs this week, we got um, really awesome pricing from FedEx on our air packages. And that doesn't mean a whole lot to anybody, except that FedEx ground distribution network is falling apart. And so we negotiated rates with them so that our air boxes will be comparable in price to our ground boxes. Mm. Um, air is a guaranteed delivery. So that's a huge step for us in COVID. Um, it means that our customers are um, much more likely to stick around because their box will get there on time <laughs> and at temperature than rolling the dice on a ground package. So there's that. And um, Let's see, what else was awesome? Today, we are delivering meals for Cornerstone Schools, which if you know Cornerstone Schools, they have um, 200 students around the city that are virtual and 95% of them rely on breakfast and lunch from school. So we are delivering their weekly meals every Friday. So That's after amazing. The fall, I'm gonna go hop in a cargo van and go to um, Cornerstone Schools. That's, that's amazing. Um, I think Mary brings up something um, that's really important to note just about uh, being in business. There's so many pieces, parts that affect business, like that can affect a business. And obviously with COVID disrupting our supply chain, that that has implications on every single piece of the business that you're doing. And so I get what you just said about FedEx and that being a joy of this week because, so has anybody, and I'm gonna ask you on here, have you ever heard of the brand Daily Harvest? Like you see the commercials, it's like the smoothies, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So I'm a subscriber to Daily Harvest and it was so interesting to me. So I was waiting for my box like all day yesterday cause like I haven't had no smoothies this week and I feel some type of way about it. And then yesterday evening, the, you got an email blast from the um, the CEO of Daily Harvest, and they have run out of ice packs. So whatever ice packs they were using, the like the country or wherever they're sourcing them from is completely out, which means they can't package those smoothies because they'll go bad before they get to you, which means they can't ship anything until Monday. And so that is a serious service disruption because it's a pretty premium product that you're paying for. And so when you think it's coming as the customer, you're like, it's supposed to come. And so what Mary is saying, being able to meet slash exceed her customers' expectations, and it seems like shipping and it's boring. Oh, it's critical. So totally feel you. And okay. last one, last one I got for you right now is where were you? It's two part. How long have you been in business either, you know, from ideation to where you are today? And uh, where were you when your business idea hit you? What was your aha? Well, this is interesting. Much like Ashley, um, we didn't have this like aha moment. Um, I remember I was doing some freelance work, recipe development and food styling. And a, a lady that I was working on a cookbook with said, hey, I belong to Iron Trap Fitness and they're looking for somebody to do meals. I know that you and K Tiffany have a catering company. Do you think that you could like deliver like some meals to the gym? And I was like, oh, sure, whatever. Yeah, that's no big deal. So I talked to the people and, you know, we work out the details and it's supposed to be, you know, a couple hundred meals delivered to their gyms across Birmingham. And we start in December, which is obviously the low time for people wanting to eat healthy. And within three weeks, it had like tripled. And I was like, oh, wait a second. Like, this is not a side hustle. This is like bringing in real dollars and kind of swallowing me whole. And so that's when I kind of looked at it like, oh, is this something that, is this a real business? Like, why would people want to get food delivered to a gym? That's nasty to me, but whatever, I'll do it. And so um, that's kind of how the idea was born. And we actually got to work with Iron Tribe as they expanded across the country. And um, it was it was in 2012. So if you think about it back then, Blue Apron had just started. People were not used to getting any food product delivered to their house. That was a very novel concept outside of pizza and Chinese. And so um, over the course of two years of working with them, we got to cut our teeth on that community and really understand the logistics of shipping fresh food from here to New Orleans and how much ice do you need and what's the right packaging. And it really set us up um, for kind of understanding, like Ashley said, the demand and like, 
Is there really a product here? How do we work on that product? How do we figure out how to get it to people's doorsteps instead of the gym? And mm -hmm. so we got to make our adjustments working with them that when we actually had a reason to go to market, we had already tested all the pieces and processes. Mm -hmm. It was not perfect by any means, but we already had a dedicated client base and product line that we could draw from that we were not rolling the dice at that point. So we launched our own brand uh, about two years later and we had made all the mistakes already. Mm -hmm. you know, what so years are we talking about? Uh, we worked with them exclusively from 2012 to 14. And okay. then that's when we launched the first Nourish brand was at the end of 14. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mary. I'm going to come back around. And last but not least, we got Lauren, who is reporting to us from somewhere cool. Like uh, all the rest of us are like home or at our office somewhere, but you're somewhere cool. So where are you, Lauren? I am in Atlanta. We are, I'm in the Atlanta History Museum, which I can't wait to walk around. I have not been able to do that yet. But anyway, that's where I am. Well, tell us um, who you are, what you do. Sure. Well, first, I don't cook. So I don't know, I'm probably the worst panelist because I cannot bring that to the table, but I do run a full service wealth management business called Somerset. It, we have clients across the Southeast. And then my most recent venture, which I think we're going to mainly talk about today is the Wealth Edit, which is a semi-private private community for women to talk about wealth online. So love it. Uh, where are you I from do. originally? I feel like, are you, are you native too? I, no, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So you're from Charlotte. How did you get to Birmingham? So I got here through my husband. So he is a minister and he's the minister at the Cathedral Church of the Advent downtown. So that's gotcha. what brought us to Birmingham. Well, see, that's a fun fact that I did not know. Like I didn't, I didn't yeah. know that. Well, I was going to say fun <laughs> fact. There you go. Uh, what did you study in college? I studied journalism. So I guess through the wealth edit, I'm a little bit getting back to my roots. So we took, I, I, um, when I fell in love, I was in Washington, D.C., and he said, will you marry me? We're moving to Beaufort, South Carolina, which that's where I met what, someone who's listening today, which is so fun. One of my old friends who I saw was on the call. Um, so there's nothing to do in Beaufort unless you were like independently wealthy, a <laughs> lawyer or a doctor. And I wasn't any of those things, but I was a worker. So I had to find a low barrier to entry career, which is financial services. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, fair enough. So I was going to say, you've kind of like, you've, uh, you've uh, kind of up upheld our thesis. We have one person who, ha who has a business degree on the line, which is great because it's Ashley. And then the rest of us, we study something else because I too am broadcasting major. My whole point yes. is uh, there's a lot of different things that you can study to make you successful as an entrepreneur or to add value to you as an entrepreneur, for sure. Um, yes. So tell us about your family makeup. Sure. So I'm married. I have three little girls. They're all in elementary school um, and a menagerie of animals. We live on three acres and have a lot of other living things that we take care of besides our children. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, this is a fun question because we're, of course, talking about um, you're going to be we're going to be talking about money. So tell yes. me, what is the last thing that you bought for yourself? Hashtag self care. <gasps> Oh, I bought this shirt for the call today. Saks was having a sale and I was in Atlanta and I, we've, I've recently started working with someone that's going to like help me, you know, make good decisions about my clothes. So anyway, this was on the list of things to buy. So here I am. In my well, there shirt. you go. I was going to say, well, I was going to say that was easy and you're modeling it. Thank you so much for yes. setting me up for a layup. <laughs> Uh, where were you when your business idea hit you? And I, something that I'm going to touch on, Lauren, when we come back around to you is uh, you have a, a full-time business, your financial yes. services, and then the wealth edit right now, I mean, it's a like it's a hustle. So you're the yes. quintessential, you're doing your full-time business and you're doing your hustle. So tell us, where were you when the hustle became a, I should actually move on this. Yeah. So at Somerset, which is my private practice, like we really like to specialize in things where we feel like we have a unique perspective or niche. Um, and so one of them being in the Southeast is being a woman um, because there aren't many female financial advisors in general. Um, it's about 14% of CFPs that are client facing that are female. And you can imagine that, you know, if you drill it down into women of color, that's even a smaller number. And so 
anyway, we are very devoted to serving women because women are taught from a very young age that it's tacky to talk about money. Um, but when we started diving into the niche of women, we realized it's really not a niche, it's half the population. And so how do we really um, take what we've learned uh, in our over, you know, 13 years of experience in financial services and dealing with private clients and bring that to a larger percentage of the population. And so that's where the idea of the wealth edit came is, you know, what we realized is that if financial services talks to women at all or tries to speak to them, what they really do is like tie a pink bow on us and hope that we like it or make their website pink, where really, all, all women's financial journey is a little bit different. There are similarities and we call those at the Wealth Edit glide paths. Um, but there are some, there are, um, my co-founder and I are a great example. Her name's Emily Lassiter and she's amazing. She's a little bit like Tiffany and Mary. They have each other. And it's great. Um, she's like my Tiffany, but she, uh, we look alike. We run in the same social crowd, but socio, like our financial glide path could not be more different. She went from a dual to single income home. And that just comes with its own set of financial challenges. So, you know, that's mainly what we're trying to highlight with the Wealth Edit is, hey, like, let's put some content together and some lead you on a path that you're going on anyway. You take a fun quiz um, and then you get to talk to other women who are in like a very similar place as you. So that's what I would say. Yes, I was, which I think is so important. You know, men tend to be more open, I feel, talking about their finances, which is why they yes. can pass knowledge from one another. Like, I'm investing yep. in this, I'm trading in this, I'm doing this, I have this kind of bond, whatever it is. And then women are less likely to have conversations like that because it's taboo or it was right. taboo. But um, it's uh, it's critical, specifically because the role that women have, like at work, in the household, all of that stuff is changing. So interesting, and we will come back around. So Ashley, we have made it like to the back around. So let me dig in on some things with you. So a pivot is described as a modification while retaining some continuity with its previous version. That's the definition. So. Tell, tell us here, what was on your mind on January 1st of 2020 and what is on your mind today? Okay, January, I was telling these ladies last week, um, I feel like in 2020, we were like, Ashley Max was most prepared for everything that we could have done minus a pandemic. Um, <laughs> but like, as far as planning on specials and all the things that have to happen, obviously to run a business. And so we were very well staffed. Um, I was leaps and bounds ahead of where I feel like I normally am with like, like I said, with specials or things that are coming around the corner. I'm very, for years, like very fly by the seat of my pants, like as far as like, oh, let's try that tomorrow. And the bigger, you know, your business gets, you can't just like throw a special on the board the next day. You know, you have, have locations, you got to make sure everybody knows is trained, everybody's doing it right. So we were very, very, I feel like prepared more than we've ever been just for like the next day and what can we do better and all that kind of thing. So then March hit and I was actually in, I will never forget, I was in my Homewood location and all of a sudden it was that week, you know, March, this was the 13th, I think, but um, that week and it was like eerie outside, like all of a sudden it was like something was happening, you know, it was just weird and I don't even remember the details of like if schools, schools still weren't out, but the word was it was going to close the next week, I think that was what was going on. So anyway, I remember being in the store and just like, we've got to shut down the dining rooms tomorrow. Like no one's coming in all of a sudden for like two days. It was like just weird. And so anyway, we shut down our dining room before it was like a mandate to, and we just did take out. And then that next, you know, day it was basically like dining rooms going to close and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, our kind of pivot was we were very, very thankful and blessed that we were already set up for takeout. So unlike a lot of fine dining restaurants and other places, I can't even imagine the challenges of that, but we were already had the packaging. We already, that was like a huge part of my business already. And so honestly that we just had to kind of step it up and, and push that and be like, make sure everyone knew that we had that. Like the dining customers that met ladies for lunch knew you can grab this stuff and just go home and get it. So that was really kind of our thing. And then curbside, obviously, which all the restaurants, you know, had to start doing when the dining rooms closed and people were afraid to come in. So even though they could come in to Ashley Max and grab their stuff, you know, we wanted to basically be accommodating to what everyone's feelings were about the situation. And so that was, um, you know, the main thing. And then 
you know, I remember waking up that next day and my first thought was, um, you know, obviously with our employees and like, okay, people aren't coming in. I can't pay all the, if, if you know anything about the restaurant industry, we, we run on like very tight margins. So you can't just, you know, oh, we're just going to let everybody come and, and pay them and hope that it works out. I mean, that's just not financially feasible. And so, um, you know, that was kind of being in the stores and trying to figure out who needs to be, um, you know, temporarily um, let go for a little while until we can, you know, furloughed until we can figure things out. That was hard. And just every day kind of coming with my managers and like almost like the war room of like, okay, we got to figure this out. Like, what do we need to do today? How can we service the customers? What are, what is the market like today? What are they wanting? You know, so, cause it was almost like Y2K at our Coppa Heights location. People were coming in and just like grabbing like hundreds of dollars of stuff thinking, oh my gosh, like, are we going to be locked in our houses for weeks? So that was obviously good for us, but then it's like, well, then what are they going to do that next week? You know, <laughs> do I need to keep producing all this food or is that going to back off? So it was just a lot of every day was different. Like coming in, it's like, okay, what am I going to do today? Like what, you know, we did produce boxes for a little while, just trying to, cause people were thinking that was going to be scarce. And so anyway, we just kind of tried to, you know, be creative. And then it's like I said, the pizzas came out of that and different meal ideas of like, what else can we do that a customer can come in and just grab and make it home. So there was lots of wheels spinning up here as well as obvious, the usual anxiety of what's going on. And, you know, I think I shared, like I wasn't sleeping much because it was just, I was working all day and then thoughts, you know, all night long. It's like, okay, what, what is tomorrow going to look like? And, but I'm very grateful. It's like, you know, I feel like God always gives you what you need when you need it, you know, and so I've had like, it was like a miraculous energy. Like I really was in a good, I wasn't really stressed out. It was weird. It was like for six weeks, it was just like, okay, what do I have to do tomorrow? You know, it was just kind of like that adrenaline almost, you know, which eventually did wear off a little bit. But, <laughs> but. but it, what it sounds like um, is your foundation, because we talked about the way that you came into business. So the foundation that you had, because you started small, because you went through the phase of people grabbing and going and whatever, basically your pivot was being able to go back to your roots because you had the expertise. You just had to figure out how to do it at scale. And one thing that you said to me when we had an early earlier conversation, which I think is very interesting. You kind of just touched on it. So as a business owner, you carry a lot of, I think, emotional weight because mm -hmm. you understand that like if something in the world is affecting the business, which means it's affecting the way you can pay your employees, that sort of thing, it's heart wrenching, but yeah. you have to be able to make business decisions. But something that you said to me in an earlier conversation is you mentioned that your people fought for you. Like they fought for your brand. They fought yeah. to keep it going because they believed in what was going on. Tell us, what do you believe that that says about the culture that you have? Like what makes you proud about that because that's a big deal well I was very very proud and um just to see people step up and do whatever you know employees being like I will do whatever I will you know I'm not usually the one that sweeps the floors but I will sweep the floors today you know whatever we need to do it did make me proud of just you know it made me think how we built our company has been worth it you know that we hold tight values to grace and to um, you know, seeing the person as a whole and um, seeing their dignity they have, no matter what, if they're the janitor, or if they're the headline cook or whatever they are, that they all have, you know, dignity and worth and that um, we're just grateful for the culture that is, um, like I said, grace-based and like we, you know, people make mistakes and we all want to learn and grow together. And so I think that has paid off that, you know, people know that we value them as a person, not just what can you do for us and how can you make us more money? You know, that that's not what it's about. So. Y'all, my, my puppy just started whining, which is why I kept going on mute. Anyway, <laughs> um, last question that I have for you is um, tell us something um, that, that kind of has spun out from the pandemic that you're going to keep. Because, you know, I think there's a lot of like, oh, my gosh, it changed my business and oh, my gosh, it's horrible and whatever. But is there something, whether it's like a business practice or even it could be something that you personally started doing, like to like manage stress or whatever it is, like what's something that's happened that you will now keep as you go forward? Yeah, um, you know, I think, um, OK, we had started we have not been real big on like online ordering and we started that pre pandemic pre-pandemic, but not too much before. And obviously with the pandemic, it's like, you've got to have that, you know? And so we have a shelf at the front of each Ashley Max, um, an online ordering shelf. So you can, on, not only can you order online, but you can come in and just grab it and go. And honestly, that has helped so much just in the flow of like 
our business. And when we're slammed, someone doesn't have to wait in line or try to figure out, hey, I've got to tell them I'm here, but I already paid for it. So I know that seems like little, but when you're running, you know, and you have like a huge lunch rush, having that um, organized and in place. And like I said, that was thought of before everything happened, but it was kind of pushed us to do that. So I think there was a lot of actually several things that kind of came out, which was like, let's just go ahead and do this. Like, what do we have to lose at this point? You know? So um, I would say that's one of the, you know, big things that um, might sound little, but it's been like very beneficial for us. So I love that. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm going to move back over to Mary. Mary, can you, you had an interesting, um, I would say you found out about the pandemic, what was going on in the city of Birmingham, like all of that, like came together, like as a crash course and kind of different from everyone else. Like you kind of got to see that roll out in real time because you were with the people who were making the decisions. Uh, um, so yeah, that was, it was so interesting. So um, to go back, that was, I think it was, um, sorry, my computer message is come on all the time and I can't figure out how to cut them off. That's a tech problem. Hello. Um, but so we were, um, we were at a meeting or invited to a meeting on Sunday, the 15th, which was like, I think Friday we got the call that like, this will be the last day of school for three weeks. And I didn't really understand why, because I was like, this is stupid. Like this isn't going to impact us. You know, at that point, like everything was still normal. It just felt like, okay, well, this is a little bit premature in my mind. So we went to this meeting that was hosted, or it was a group of civic community food people that were all at Innovation Depot with the mayor's office. And what they were trying to put together was like, what happens when all of these people get laid off and what other problems come from the roll off of that issue, like people getting sick or we just didn't know what was coming. So we were basically like putting together um, the framework of um, a citywide initiative to say, here's how Birmingham city is gonna step in and help its residents that are suddenly either without food or elderly people now stuck at home and can't get out. And I think that it was more, it, it was very premature in my eyes because it was like, this isn't really a problem. So why are we planning for something that's maybe not a problem? But on the flip side of that, it was really remarkable because when things did become a problem, the framework had already been thought out and kind of set up so that we could easily step in and assist in the capacity that we um, execute really well in and um, but we were sitting in this meeting and there was all these restaurateurs in there the fine dining people that Ashley mentioned and it was a Sunday and they got the call in advance to say Tuesday night will be your last night open and although they said on TV that it was going to be a week I think um, in that room we knew it was not a week and so they kind of had that like <gasps> oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And I think how a lot did you, how did you manage? Like, like, I mean, like, you know, the people handle things differently. So what was the first, what was your first thought? Like hearing that in real time, like what was your first thought that the action that you need to take for your business or what I think Tiffany was Tiffany there with you? Yeah, we were in okay. separate rooms, but um, she was in the same, you know, in the same innovation depot, but um. For our business, we aren't a retail business. So it was kind of, we have been insulated from um, COVID to that, from that perspective. Luckily, I mean, same thing that Ashley said they had set up their online ordering. We have only ever existed as e-commerce. We don't have any foot traffic. We operate as a you know, this is a production facility. No one really can come in here. Um, and so we were blessed to have already been set up in that framework. But I think that we obviously felt the emotional, you know, reaction that they felt at that time, because it was just like, you could see the wheels were turning, like, how is this going to impact all of my employees? And as we were trying to solve for this problem that none of us really thought existed, suddenly like it existed within that room. Um, and I think that, you know, Ashley can probably attest to this too, 
because I'm sure that she thinks this as well. But from the standpoint of the restaurant industry as a whole, I think that we don't even really know how this is going to shape up for them. Mm -hmm. You know, currently a lot of them are being propped up by PPP. And I think when that runs out, I don't know. I just don't know. And I think that restaurants as we knew them um, are going to be very different. All that to say, last night we were at El Zunzun and it was packed. So I'm super grateful that people are still out there supporting all of the local restaurants. I think that's absolutely what needs to happen. Um, I think it'll just take different forms from here on out. We don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, in our, in our first conversation that we had, you explained, um, something awesome partnership that has happened in your business, uh, uh, as, a you know, after COVID happened and whatnot, something that you didn't think that you would do, like, you know, if, if it was just business as normal, but yeah. something that came in your life kind of as a result of this. And I wait on the last call, I was like, man, you went from good to gooder because you were already <laughs> doing good work. You were, um, you know, you were nourishing people's bodies, no pun intended, but now you're doing that in a different way. Tell us about that. Yeah. So within that meeting, we were, we, there was a lot of people there. United Way was one of them at the table that said, um, you know, they deliver Meals on Wheels for seniors um, each week that are, you know, homebound and low income. And um, I don't think that they realized at the time, but we were forming an idea about how to get meals to people that weren't on that list really. So as their wait list expanded, they were able to pick up the phone and say, hey, I know that y'all know how to do this. This is your expertise in high volume production and delivery. So can y'all step in, which is a, not even a big ask for us. I think that the, the COVID opportunity for us was to see that our expertise in, in that framework is um, valuable to a greater community and um, we have an ability to impact these organizations in a positive way that we really didn't have before COVID. So our regular Nourish customer is, you know, they fit into a certain demographic and that was the group that we were constantly going after the acquisition of you know, that woman, she's 35 to 55, she has a household income of X, and she likes to be healthy, and she's, you know what I'm saying, so we had this, like, demographic, and what COVID has done for us is really opened our eyes to different product lines that meet the needs of people that we wouldn't have normally considered our customer, and so that includes students, that includes elderly population, and the, the most interesting thing from a business perspective is it has turned our mission of nourishing people um, into a much more mature version of that right so like we get a we derive a ton of value as a business from serving the seniors in our community and just to hear the things that our career team talks to these people in the field like that courier might be the only person that that senior citizen sees in the whole week Mm -hmm. And it is, it's just been really dramatic for our group to understand that like what we thought was our mission, which is a great mission, um, it actually has a greater purpose than what we even realized. I love that. I love that. I was going to say, again, positive coming from the pandemic. And my last thing that I have from you, uh, the last thing that I have for you, because I think this is super important. So I y'all when people say like you know how does xyz do it all like you know you would be looking on social media you'd be looking on um instagram and whatnot and, like you look at i don't know uh let's just okay i'm gonna say kim kardashian she's the first person that came to my mind it's like how does she does it all um the answer to that is she does not like she got yeah. a full team to help her do it and so you know i think someone as a woman in our community as a woman with family a husband a business how do you instead of do it all let's say how do you hit everything that needs to be done personally and professionally how you keep things flowing yeah i think i have learned a lot over the last eight years of running this business um and being you know in the trenches differently at different times um but i think i have 
finally realized that from a personal standpoint and a professional standpoint, I have to pick and choose what is the priority for me. And it can't be everything, right? So like we, we talked about this last week, but um, one of the things when, when COVID hit and school is out all of a sudden and those three weeks extended to a month and then it extended to, hey, we're not going back at all. Um, I had to say to myself and to my kids, look, this is a busy season in mom's life at work. And this is not a busy season in your life at school. So there, I had to give up the fact that like they were not going to do online school. Or if they did do online school, the onus was on them. I couldn't be there to monitor that. And I just had to be okay with it. Um, and not feel that mommy guilt, because I think that we place that on ourselves. And it just isn't something that I'm capable of doing right that moment. Now, if it, if it happens again, I'll have to, you know, relook at that priority and say, okay, well, now they're in a new school year. Like, do I need to pay for a tutor to come to the house because I can't be there or, you know, but I just think that like, I have had to kind of set my priorities and say, these are the things that are an absolute. This is like my A column and I have to get these done and say no to things that I don't, I can't take on, you know? I was going to say, I think you, I, again, I think you've just kind of really defined part of the hustle, which is you can't do everything and you got to understand where you can cut to make room for the things that you actually need to do. I think something that was super hard for me as an entrepreneur is I'm a perfectionist. I like to hit everything at 100% since becoming an entrepreneur. I hit everything about 80, 85, and I feel pretty good about it because it's like, it's all still standing. It's all still working. You know, yeah. if, if I forgot to like change a color on something or whatever, like I'm like, guess what? Nobody sees that but me. Get it out. It's fine. So right. um, yeah, so I think that that's like an important thing to have in your toolkit. So thank you, Mary. And Lauren, let's come back around to you. So <clears throat> obviously, um, you we talked about this business and hustle going. So you kind of explained for what your original vision for the wealth edit was or is. Tell us how that has just evolved with the times from oh, what sure. you thought you were going to do to what you're doing today. Yeah, so we thought that there was going to be a lot of like physical community involved in the wealth edit. And what happened is we launched an international women's day. And then four days later, we all went into quarantine. So we uh, online was always like going to be a part of the wealth edit, but not the center of the wealth edit um, until COVID hit. And so we had to basically throw everything out that we had planned and start afresh. And so um, we learned really quickly how to do online and what to do. And so we started highlighting female business owners um, each week or just interesting women that might have a cool story to share with our, the other members of our community. It's called Wealth Edit Wednesdays. Some are open and some are closed just to our membership. So we started doing that. We started things called um, Wealth Pods or Wealth Circles, which are online circles of smaller women concentrating on a certain subject. So entrepreneurship, um, financial minimalism, what we call the comeback theory. So we've started we've started these different communities where you can participate. Um, so that is what that's sort of what we've pivoted to. Now our our original purpose was to also like launch city by city in the southeast. We put that on pause for a minute, but we are actually launching in Atlanta on September 15th, which is why I'm here today. So a lot of it will be virtual. It's still going to be fun, um, but just kind of different than what we had planned. So we're in the middle of another pivot as we're sitting here talking. Um, and I'd say the other thing that we did was we realized, and Kim kind of mentioned this, I think in the chat feature, is a lot of what, what I started doing is going down a rabbit hole at the beginning of the quarantine and saying, okay, we're going to go into a recession. A lot of our people are business owners and, uh, you know, I'm specifically interested in the female business owners. So, you know, what, what happened to female business owners in 2007 through 2009? And what happened is what we 
went to, if we're just looking at us broad, broadly generalizing everybody who's a female, which is not a good idea, but, you know, generally women really held on to what they had, if they had a business and cut and just tried to protect their business to make sure it stayed afloat. When they went back and surveyed those businesses, the businesses were still open, but they were smaller than pre-recession kind of numbers. And so we got together with a group of, we just said, okay, what if a bunch of female business owners just get together, start this thing called the pivot fund, give a thousand dollars. And together we can make a huge impact in one female entrepreneur's life. So we got 194 applications. We called it the pivot fund. Mary participated in it. She was like our first yes, which I'll never forget. And so it was just really fun for these like female business owners to get together and support other women. Um, and so anyway, we got 194 applications from across the Southeast and um, picked Jessica Finley from Neo Waste as our winner. And she um, just bought a shredder, which is really going to help the, the front end of her business, which we're really excited about. So that's a little bit of what we've been doing. The Pivot Fund was not part of the original plan for the Wealth Edit, but is now a big part of the fabric of the Wealth Edit. I was going to say also from good to gooder, which is awesome. I don't know why that's my favorite phrase for the day, but it is, <laughs> and I'm keeping it. Um, so tell me um, a, a couple things. So this is a blanket statement and like we could stay on this particular question for like a long time, but like just blanket, like easy answer. What is the state of women in, in their finances today? And what are you trying to make better? Like generally? Yeah. So I would say very generally, we just need to add talking about money to our vernacular of things that we talk about socially. And I'm not saying talk about how much is in your 401k, um, but generally like, oh yeah, are you saving for this? Or, hey, what is an HSA anyway? Or I have one of those at work. Do you? You know, we don't talk about those kinds of things, um, but we make financial decisions all the time. Or, hey, I'm hiring an interior decorator. All right. That's a you know, five to seven figure decision for some people. So, you know, you're, you're making financial decisions. Women, actually 90% of women are going to end up as the financial head of household at some point in their life. Now that fact and figure may make some women like want to stick their head in the sand. And that's what we think. If we just start talking about it, then maybe we'll feel more comfortable when we're in that situation, whether we elect to be in that situation or not. Um, and actually when women do start investing, we're incredible investors. Women are great at that. So we're able to follow a plan. We understand the, the significance and importance of following a plan. And so naturally we're very good at it if we can get there. I was gonna say, I love that. Um, tell me um, what are, cause you know, I think part of the problem becomes you hear something like that, like, you know, women, we need to get more into finance, like, you know, and it, it can, uh, it can add like some undue stress. Like you're like, yeah. Oh my God, like, you know, like, that's not my thing. Like, uh, like me, I'm like not a math person. I've never been a math person, but like, you know, understanding finances, I get it. So tell anybody listening or who will listen to this, like, what is like an actionable step or steps they could take like today, like obviously join the wealth edit, but yes. what are some practical things to do to make yourself just more aware? Yeah. So I think just starting out, I mean, Hey, a good thing might be to start listening to our podcast that's free and available. Um, but just start to ask maybe a brave question, whether that's inside your household or to, like someone that you think is doing something well. So let's say that you are, you know, a stay at home mom that wants to start a business. Okay. Find another stay at home mom who started a business and say like, Hey, how'd you do that? Did you plan any way, in any way financially, could you help me with that? You know, like just start a tiny conversation. That's what we try to do through the wealth edit, through these wealth circles is create that group for you. Because I think women in general, I mean, it is lonely to be a, you know, female entrepreneur. It's hard to find that community unless you search for it. And I think that that's true of women, whether you work inside the home or outside the home, we kind of lose that community in adulthood. So kind of create that ask, just a brave question um, to someone that you think might know something about money. I love it. And one thing, and I swear, you've been like, you keep setting me up for layups with where I was going. <laughs> so uh, the one thing that I did want to touch on you, so you're in the most, I would say, formal field of any of us who are on the call, you know, finance, yeah. like, you know, people have, people are like, oh, finance, like, let me sit up, let me put my good clothes on, all that. <laughs> um, 
tell us how work from home has been for you. Obviously, this this switch to work from home has been profound. Like I have not put on clothes since um, I'm in workout clothes right now. So that I I I literally, y'all, I get up, I put on workout clothes, and the reason I do that is because after I'm done working, I go straight to a workout. And then like, there's no question about what happened. Like it happened, uh, but it's a little bit different for you. So tell us, what have you discovered about work from home? You know, do you have any hacks to share about how to make it work specifically if you're in a more formal field where you can't just, you know, be in Fabletics all the time, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think having some like comfortable core pieces just from a wardrobe standpoint that you'd feel proud of getting on a zoom call um i think that's good but i think more importantly for me the most impactful thing that happened is i have never let myself work from home i felt like there would be a stigma attached to me working from home as a female in financial services like i wasn't taking my job seriously and that's something that i realized in quarantine was an undue pressure that i was putting on myself um that was not uh, you know, I was being harder on myself than I know my clients would be because I have the best clients in the entire world. But like, I just wish I wouldn't have done that. And I encourage other women who are in more formal fields to sort of navigate that with a little less pressure on yourself because I wish I would have done that sooner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Well, I was going to say before I give it back over to Kim and thank you ladies, uh, Ashley, Mary and Lauren, I do have one more rapid question that I want to ask you guys. Yeah. Um, tell me, um, t tell me like finish this phrase, which is 2021 is going to be Ashley go for it. Amazing. I'm going to think positive. Right. Thoughts. <laughs> okay, I was going to say, guess what? Amazing gets us there. Mary, 2021 is going to be? I think it'll be the best year Nourish has had. I'm going positive for you, Ashley. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And Lauren? 2021 is not going to be 2020. Guess what? <laughs> guess what? I was going to say, so we'll take it. Yeah, well, I was going to say, we'll take it. Well, I was going to say, Kim, and we can't say enough about Kim. Kim doesn't like people talking about her, but like, fine, I'll talk about her. So Kim is an extraordinary entrepreneur who continues to always lift up other entrepreneurs and I think bring their stories and their businesses to the forefront. Uh, Kim and her team are very intentional, like when they plan something about making it community involved. And, you know, that's something that takes intention, just like, um, just like diversity takes intention. Like you can't just expect it to happen you have to set it up to be so and Kim um, as long as I've known her has always been a person who really takes the time to do that so Kim we appreciate you and your platform and the space and because Kim won't talk about herself I will say <laughs> I'm a I'm a forge worker and um, the most beautiful thing that Kim has done aside from what her aesthetic is because it's gorgeous up there is she has really woven together a community of people that you can collaborate with learn from you know I think break bread with with all of that, because it's really not the space, it's the people in that space that power what goes on there. And you have done a beautiful, you and Kelsey have done a beautiful job with that. So with that, I am going to send the ball to you. Well, you are so sweet. And I'm still like crying from you saying, I, I haven't put on clothes since it started. No. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, this is over. And like, I no longer had to put on, I, I had to try to fill in my, my eyebrows God. the other day. And I was like, I was like, maybe I need to go get a stencil. I can't remember how to do it. So yeah, this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you ladies so much. This has been so encouraging to me. And I know for everybody else on the call, um, there are a few um, questions and I'm going to have to scroll back through the first question. Um, and this is directed to Ashley McMakin. Um, as a new business owner, Ashley Mack's discussion about corporate culture touched me. I'm very focused on building a culture where we um, value our clients and our staff for the unique people that they are. It seems so contrary to how the working world has historically viewed things. Do you think women leading is changing that focus and why? Oh man, good question. Um, I definitely 100% think women obviously add, um, a different kind of value to that than Amanda's and I, I run the business with my husband. So I can say we do complement each other very well. And I think there's like the fostering of community and making people feel appreciated comes more naturally, at least 
in my field, it seems like to the women in our field than even the management, you know, the women management versus the men. And I do think for us, it's been a beautiful thing to see that complement of men and women working together. And that's how my workforce is, but I realize everyone's is different. But so all that to say, I do think there's something about the way God made us to be nurturers and to be, um, um, foster kind of like care for people and community is for me, I think comes more naturally to me and some of our female leaders than it does to the men. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I do think that women obviously are very, um, important in that role. And I think, um, just have a lot of natural instincts, I think, to, um, create a culture that people feel welcomed, loved, appreciated. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Okay. Another question is how do we join the wealth edit? Oh, oh you're still muted. Hang yeah, I'm on mute. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so our membership is currently closed right now because what we're trying to do is a really formal onboarding process for new members and that they come in a group. So um, the next membership opportunity will be on September 15th. But what you can do is go to the website, which is wealthedit.com and take the quiz. You'll get your glide path. And from there, we'll be able to know when, um, when we open membership, you will be on our list. Thanks for asking. Um, okay, are there any more questions? Just gonna give y'all a second. I will say, speaking to the point um, about the question that was just asked and also what Ashley was talking about with employees and very grace-based and dignity in all people, um, a book that I've read, I, was, I, I like to read books about business, but, um, is Excellence Wins. I don't know if any of y'all have read that, but it's by um, Horst Schultz, who's one of the co-founders of the Ritz-Carlton, which is like my, um, like, I'm like such a nerd. Like, I love studying the Ritz. Everything they do, I think is perfect, but which is probably not true. But, um, you know, one of the chapters is talking about employees and just the dignity in people and how all of our employees are really serving each other. Like, we're serving our employees and giving every employee that dignity and that knowledge, like letting them know how important they really are to making your business go. And I think that really um, shifts how you treat people and the way that you treat them graciously and build them up when uh, making sure that they know how important you think they are and how important they are to making your business run, which I think sometimes is just easy to get overlooked when you have like a gajillion things to do and you just feel stressed you've hired people to do them. Like, but, but as a business leader, and I think as a woman, it does, it, you feel the nurturing side to how important it really is to nurture your employees. And um, yeah, it's a great book. So, um, but if there are no other questions from you ladies, we are so thankful for y'all being here. We really wanted to um, be a good steward of your time. So we're going to be ending right on time. Um, and we will be following up with an email that will give y'all links to the upcoming Forge events. Uh, we hope that y'all will, um, join us there. And if y'all have any other topics that you would like to see us address, we would love to hear from you. We, um, like Ashley said, I don't, we do love to build up other business leaders. So one of the great one of our greatest joys at Forge is that we get to walk alongside people as they're growing their business and the highs and the lows, because that can happen within five minutes. But, um, and so we also love to connect business owners, not just our members, but people in Birmingham, whatever we can do to build up the ecosystem in Birmingham. So we'd love to hear from y'all how we can help. Um, and thank y'all so much for joining us today. I hope that you have a great weekend even though it's going to be rainy you can cuddle up with the book or catch up on who knows um school work for kids uh anyways <laughs> y'all have a great day and um a great weekend thank you